Yeah. 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 Hey there YouTube, the Dapper Dinosaur here. Before we get into it, I want to remind you to like this video, and if you're not already subscribed, please subscribe. Remember to hit the bell icon so you're always notified when there's new Dapper Dino content. Okay, now that the YouTube stuff is out of the way, I'm back to review the second two games I got from Genius Games at GeniusGames.org. These two are Cytosis and Nerd Word Science. Cytosis is a board game simulating the chemistry going on inside a human cell, and Nerd Word Science is a trivia-based game with a timer. For full disclosure, I received no money for this review, but I did receive the games for free. First, let's talk about Cytosis. Cytosis is a game that simulates the action of a human cell. At first, I thought it could just be said to be a simulation of an animal cell, but given how much alcohol detox goes on, it's gotta either be a human or a St. Kitts vervet, as those are the only animals that normally need that much protection from alcohol. Okay, so the game comes with a lot of stuff, starting with a rulebook, a two-sided board, a pamphlet explaining the science, 43 cell component cards, 6 goal cards, 1 first player token, 25 ATP tokens, 66 macromolecule cubes, themselves split between red protein, black mRNA, green carbohydrates, and yellow lipids, 22 flasks in both player colors and gray, 15 round player markers, 10 transport vesicle discs, and 8 multiplier tokens for keeping track of large amounts of resources. It also comes with extra resealable plastic bags for keeping track of your game components. The goal of the game is to score health points by doing various tasks for the cell, such as creating hormone receptors, hormones, or enzymes, clearing up alcohol toxicity, and completing goal cards. Many actions in the game cost ATP to represent the energy costs of various cellular interactions. The game has locations such as the nucleus, the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, the rough endoplasmic reticulum, a free ribosome, the Golgi apparatus, cytoplasm, and two locations for plasma membranes, one for exocytosis and the other for glucose transport, as well as, of course, a mitochondrion. One rule I think you may want to change if you play with the same group of people often is that the person who goes first on the first round is the one who has most recently looked into a microscope. It's not a bad rule, but if you have one friend who uses microscopes a lot, he or she will almost always go first, so you may want to change that up every once in a while. The game has a set number of rounds based on event cards, which are minor modifiers to the gameplay. The game starts with no event in play, then all players take a turn, then the first event is played and players take another round, then go to another round with no event. This goes until the predetermined number of events, which is based on the number of players, are finished. During the turn, players place a flask in one of a few places. Most of these will provide a macromolecule cube to the player who places the flask there, but some will do other things, such as allow the player to take the first player token and thereby go first in the next round. Players may also place a transport disc at a location, such as the smooth endoplasmic reticulum, and pay from their personal stock of resources to load it with the appropriate resources. The transport vesicle will then go around collecting other resources until it can pay for a card in the player's hand, which will score health points, such as completing an enzyme. As one scores points, one moves his or her player along a numbered track on the perimeter of the board to keep track of his or her score. At the end of the last round, there are additional bonus points to be scored for things such as remaining stock of resources in a player's personal pool, or who has spent the most energy engaging in alcohol detox. The game is not simple. Each kind of cell component card requires your transport vesicle disc to visit a different sequence of organelles on the board, and the limited locations at each organelle for both flasks and vesicles mean that if a player before your turn occupies the same location you need to get to, you may be in a position to be unable to perform your next action that you need for the various cell component cards. In these cases, taking the first player token may become important for the next round. There are also goal cards, which up to two players may choose as their goal at a time. These are similar to cell component cards in that they generally score points on completion, but they are also publicly visible. Of course, this game is vastly simplified, but it still has the fundamentals of how a cell works. For example, in order to make a protein hormone, you will have to use your messenger RNA to trade for protein molecules and then place them on a transport vesicle disc on the rough endoplasmic reticulum. On a subsequent turn, you'll need to get the disc to the Golgi apparatus and place a carbohydrate onto it. Then finally, you'll need to excrete the hormone by getting to the exocytosis section of the plasma membrane, pay the ATP cost, and finally score the points associated with the protein hormone. Each type of cell component card that you try to score will require a similar sequence of transporting your macromolecules from one location to another. This is definitely a game I can see being in a regular rotation for kids or adults who like to get together and play board games. If your game of choice is Checkers or Connect 4, this game may not be for you. But if you like more complex European-style games such as Railroad Tycoon or Catan, then this will be right up your alley. 
It can also be a fun teaching tool for the science of cellular biology. Next up is Nerd Word Science. Nerd Word Science is a game somewhat like Pictionary or Charades. A word is given and a given player must give clues on what that word is. Then both teams make guess. The game comes with 162 Nerd Word cards, each with three words on it, for a total of 486 words. Three team whiteboards, where players can place bets and guesses, one clue giver whiteboard where clues are written, one betting token for the clue giver, three point tokens for keeping track of the scoreboard, also included one sand timer, and four dry erase markers. I should note that I timed my sand timer at an average 59 and a half seconds, so if your sand timer is lost or broken, just use a one minute timer on any device with such a function. Gameplay is fairly simple. First, I will be describing the game for four or more players. There are variants for three and two player games, but the default is four to eight players. Players are divided into two teams, which are divided between the players such that each team has no more than one, more or fewer than the other team. The player who has most recently worn lab safety goggles is the first clue giver, although as with Cytosis, if this is always the same person in your group of friends, you may want to vary this rule. The clue giver will take a word card and pick one of the words. He or she will then write on the clue giver's board the number of words in the science term and the first clue. He or she may also place a bet on whether his team will guess the word correctly. The clue must be a single word, although acronyms such as mtDNA can count. But the hyphenated words, such as high frequency, do not count. The clue must also start with a letter from the word. For example, the first clue for fossil could be old or skeleton. If the players reach a fourth clue, it must start with the first letter of the word to be guessed. For example, in fossil, it might be fragile, since many fossils are fragile, and fossil starts with an F. Players may also place a bet. After the clue is written down and the sand timer flipped, then both teams, minus the clue giver, have one minute to write down their guess and bet. If a bet is won, the team gets extra points, and if it is lost, they lose that many points. The clue giver may not communicate beyond the words and numbers written on his board. He may not use gestures or facial expressions to give hints. The game ends as soon as one team has passed 49 points, or the team with fewer players has used all of its word cards. If there's a tie, just play a tiebreaker round. One important rule is that the exact word does not need to be guessed. As long as the word guess has the same derivation and a similar meaning, that is close enough. For example, if the word is photosynthesis, then photosynthesize or photosynthetic will count. The rule that each clue must start with a letter from the word gives both extra information to the people guessing, but also it means that the clue giver has to put a bit of extra thought into what clues he gives. Obviously, this game is less complex than Cytosis, but that's not necessarily a bad thing. The timer adds a sense of urgency, and the betting is a nice touch that makes it possible to go for big risk, big reward strategies. Both of these games are fun, but quite different. Cytosis allows time for strategy, careful planning, and learning about how cells work. Nerd Word Science is fast paced and allows for risk taking, but not so much careful planning. Nerd Word Science is perhaps less educational, but if you like a bit more adrenaline in your game, that shouldn't be a problem. Overall, I can see either of these games being in the rotation for any regular gaming group. Remember, if you'd like to get either of these games, or many more, including Ecosystem and Mathrush, which I already reviewed, go to GeniusGames.org. They have far more than the four games I reviewed, including more biology, chemistry, and history of science games. If these games are a measure, then I feel confident that these other games are well made and fun. That's all for me for now, and as I said, please remember to like and subscribe. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Thanks for watching, but before you go, I'd like to take a second to thank my patrons and channel members, especially those pledging $20 or above. Ben Hovind, Ian Chen, Sphincter of Doom, Chris Love, Henry Hutanen, and Bob Knob. Their support helps make this channel possible, because as you may know, YouTube is a very volatile platform, and they give this channel much needed additional stability. If you'd like to join the team, a link to my Patreon page can be found in the description, and you can join with the button right below this video on YouTube. Both groups of people get access to my special patron and member only Discord channel, links to new videos before I release them to the public, as well as a pretty direct line to me. They also often are asked to do things like vote on new video topics. If a monthly subscription isn't something that you'd like to do but you'd still like to help out the channel, I also have a Teespring store that has Dapper Dino merch, including mugs, blankets, pillowcases, shirts, all sorts of things. And if none of those things are for you, then please just remember to like this video, subscribe if you haven't already, and share the video. All of those things really do help the channel grow. Well, I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Well, I don't know. I don't know.